Welcome back to the Lunchtime Catch-Up Podcast, a very special podcast tonight. Tonight, we have the very, very distinct pleasure from a couple of fans um, and a professional journo uh, to be talking to, <coughs> excuse me, to be talking to some of the very best of Essendon's 2000 uh, Premiership side um, to whip around the Zoom screen uh, to introduce them as I go. We've got Quite frankly, the best centre half forward the Bombers have ever had in Mr. Scott Lucas. Welcome, uh, Scotty. Thanks, Grant. Great to be here. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, one of the hardest running uh, midfielders I've seen play for the Bombers um, and a half decent bloke, I'm told, in Mr. Jason Johnson. Hey, Grant. Scotty, how are you? Right. Um, his uh, partner in crime and uh, possession grabber left and right, Mr. Joe Mercedes. Evening, man. Um, the bloke that invented run off the half back and an incredibly important part of our uh, of our side, Mr. Sean Wellman's with us. G'day, gents. Great to be part of this. And uh, last but absolutely not least is our mercurial character of a ruckman, Mr. John Barnes. Welcome, Barnesy. Excellent. Thank you, Barnesy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> With us to, uh, to lend a bit of uh, authenticity and professionalism to our dinky little podcast um, is the, uh, the um, journo and footyology owner, Mr. Rowan Connolly. Welcome, Rowan. Hi, guys. Uh, didn't like that pause particularly, Grant, but uh, great. No, I was, <laughs> was going to say owner. I was going to say I wanted to find the right word in there for you. Um, but we're not going to go back now because I've done all the intros. No, no. It's uh, great to be here in the uh, presence of Essendon Royalty. Absolutely. Um, with me also is my uh, my little sidekick on this um, in this little podcast, uh, Mr. Scott McNeese. Hello, everyone. Uh, just this is probably by far our favourite podcast we would have ever done. Uh, us boys being at the age nice age of uh, around forty five, forty six, two uh, thousands, obviously uh, peak time of our mid twenties, and seeing uh, by far the best uh, uh, team. Uh, result ever in AFL VFL history and I thought it would be a good uh, understanding before we kick off the show to just roll off a few stats and on what this year produced. It started off with the ANSET Cup which uh, the Bombers won with Mark McCurry being uh, the Michael Tuck medalist. Uh, then obviously the, they were the first ever team to win 20 games in a row, first ever team to win 24 games in a season, average winning margin of 51 points average winning margin in their three finals by 76 points, which is insane. Yep. Uh, North Smith medalist James Hurd, there was four All-Australians voted uh, that year, which, which was Hardwick, Hurd, Fletcher and Lloyd. Sheedy was the All-Australian coach. Matthew Lloyd, the common medalist with 109 goals. Uh, and that, that leads to uh, an interesting point because he came fifth in the best and fairest. So I'm not sure if uh, Sheeds was an anti full forward, but, uh, uh, but the, you had Dustin Fletcher winning the best and fairest that year, which is uh, for, for any year in history, that would be one of the highest regarded best and fairest uh, results for any player to have. So uh, it was a fantastic year and it's a complete and utter honour to have you guys uh, on our podcast and to rightfully celebrate one of the greatest moments in, in club history uh, and AFL VFL history for that matter. So I, I appreciate you all coming on, on board and, and look, I just wanted to, I guess, maybe start with you, Scotty, uh, just about the after the 99 game, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the, <laughs> the whole dra dra dramatics of what happened in, in a prelim final, but we all know what happened. And, and I thought it'd be a good time to ask what, uh, there's obviously talk about the boys having a lunch across the road, um, a famous kind of lunch across the road. It was like Geppetti's or something like that, was it, if I remember, uh, with Robert Shaw and, and Sheeds, and then you guys going to the grand final. Can you just explain that time and, and the feeling around after the after the prelim loss? Uh, look, I think uh, the overwhelming thought from the preliminary final was that it was, it was an opportunity lost. Uh, the guys had played such a good year. I think 
Essendon was the best team in it that year, but the best team doesn't always uh, win the flag, unfortunately. And I, I think on the back of that, there was certainly a strong resolve to uh, hit the ground running in 2000. So Sheets did make us go to the 99 grand final and then uh, we had a meal together and I'm sure the boys can chime in. I reckon Robert Shaw did most of the talking and he spoke about what a premiership team looks like, uh, where we need to get better. And that almost is really where it started for the 2000 year for us. Yeah. Can I, I'll lead uh, Joe and Sean and Jojo and Barnsley into this one. Like I've heard a lot about that dinner. You went to the grand final as a group. I think it was dinner at Geppetto, wasn't it? Over the road in Wellington Parade. Um, I'm always interested in guys who aren't involved in the grand final, how it feels to be there watching it. I know a, a, a lot have said, I can't bear to watch it if I'm not involved. How did you guys feel actually watching the game, probably knowing in your heart of hearts that you should have been out there? Well, Rowan, I'll speak first, mate. I was at home eating my own dinner because I wasn't there in 99, so it was pretty ordinary by those blokes not to invite me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's a fair point. Well, what, yeah. what about the other guys? Oh, I'm not, I don't care about the other guys. <laughs> no, I was asking them. <laughs> oh, sorry. What do, what, do, what do you reckon, Sean, to, to jump yeah. in? What do you reckon? Um, very frustrating. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, Joe. Sorry, mate. Go ahead. You no, go, no, Joe. Joe. Sorry, mate. No, just saying it was very frustrating watching the grand finals. Probably the last thing we wanted to do after we lost the prelim. Um, we yeah, drop up to a grand final and, and watch the grand final. We probably should have thought we would have been in and, and probably should have won. Uh, obviously, as Scotty said before, the best side doesn't always win it, but uh, yeah, very frustrating. <laughs> and uh, yeah, probably sowed the seed, obviously, for, for the year after, mate. Do you remember the, um, do any of you guys remember sort of the gist of what was said at the dinner about, you know, did they, did they, I mean, Sheeds in 83 after they lost the grand final famously said, you know, no one should be happy. Did they really ram that point home that, you know, they sort of hope you're hurting about having experienced someone else? succeeding yeah I, I remember i don't remember the specifics of the meeting but i still i still remember sheeds i could still remember the north melbourne theme song in the background when we were having dinner because they play it over and over again and mm. to be honest none of us would have been at that grand final we didn't have to be there so um i remember she's just saying that you've gifted uh north melbourne a premiership um mm. and uh I think it was really, looking back, it was actually really good coaching because sometimes you just let the, that go for six weeks. You may address it when you get back to pre-season, but he, why it was raw, he actually uh, addressed the opportunity that we'd missed. And that's our basically our pre-season. That was sort of the cut-off point of the 99 season and our 2000 season started that night rather than six or seven weeks later. Um, but, yeah, it was... Um, it was certainly a tough day and, and, you know, not to take anything away from North Melbourne, but, you know, I think we let, let an opportunity slip at least to be, to compete in a grand final and have a crack at it that year. Do you, do you remember when you resumed pre-season, I'll throw this one to you, JJ, do, do you remember training being like any uh, crisper than usual or did you sense sort of a, a greater era of determination where, you, where guys... It's been much fun going back to pre-season. Did you notice the guys were especially motivated or more motivated than they had been previously? Yeah, it's a good question. I guess uh, my memories of, of 99, I, I wasn't, I guess, a part of the senior team in 99 and was still playing uh, VFL football at the time. And, you know, the VFL team happened to win the premiership that year and Scotty was part of that uh, prelim and, and played too many games uh, to play in that grand final. But I actually didn't attend the attend the dinner. So I can't really comment too much around, I guess, the dinner. But to answer your question around the pre-season side of things, I think there was definitely, you know, added motivation. I think Quinny, I mean, it, was, it all started with, with John Quinn uh, in terms of, you know, his fitness uh, program. And, uh, you know, he would throw in little elements of surprises into our, you know, our training programs just to sort of keep us on our toes, keep us, um, you know, sharp. Um, yeah, but I, I think you know most guys come back with a with an attitude to you know to to, to go you know go one more and um, and then really make amends for for ninety nine. So I think you know from memory, I think the group come back in pretty good shape. Um, there wasn't too much um, 
you know, uh, op, you know, operations. Um, I mean, we obviously lost Jim uh, and Scotty that year through pretty, pretty serious injuries. So, um, you know, the, the team was pretty fit in that 2000 pre-season. So I, I sort of feel that we, we all hit the ground pretty, you know, running all together. Um, and we were all sort of um, yeah, in pretty good shape, sort of. Uh, one to you, Barnsley. You, you said you weren't there in 99. Just tell us about the process of getting back to Essendon and how different that club had seemed when you did arrive back. Well, I don't think we've got uh, two hours, Raoul, but I'll try and fit it into three minutes if I can. Um, Adrian Dodora lives in Buckley, up in uh, top of Buckley Street in Avondale Heights. And I live just around the corner, just off Buckley Street, and I used to watch his car come over the hill. And I'd wet myself with water and I'd jump out on Buckley Street and run about 200 metres. He'd toot his horn, I'd wave, and then he'd take off. I'd walk around the corner, jump back in my car and go home. I did this for about three weeks in a row. And then Adrian must have gone to shoes and said, shit, we've got to pick up Barnes. He's frigging fit. He's on Buckley Street every morning. <laughs> he waves to me, I toot him, and he thinks, I'm thinking, wow. And about four weeks later, I get a knock on my door. Matty Drain and Sheeds come over. And they said, look, we're looking to draft a Ruckman and uh, you could be the guy. And I said, oh, I've heard that before. I said, do you want to put it in right? And they said, no. Nah. I said, well, you're full of shit. And that's pretty much how we left that conversation. And then pretty much the rest is history, Rowan. Yeah, I got a, I got a gig. And as, you, as the boys have just spoken about, <clears throat> and what I'm about to say is probably how I feel about the, um, the contribution to 2000. And I know Sheeds is an amazing coach and halves and Shorey and and the likes of that. But I, I credit the uh, 2000 Premiership to, to John Quinn. He, he, just, he just knew how to put people's egos in a position and just kept the tram on the one track. And that's what I found most impressive. I knew I'd started this and I went to Geelong and come back. And that bloke was just no bullshit. Just he knew if you were bludgeoning and he just knew if you were uh, trying to pull the wool out of someone's eyes. And I rated him that highly. It was... Um, it was ridiculous. So I put the premiership down to, to Johnny Quinn because we were, we were pretty much um, uncoachable, to be honest, in 2000. But Quinny just just was the glue to hold it all together, I reckon. Can I ask just uh, with the Sydney Olympics year, it was like a very odd year because you had the, the uh, 99 sort of New Year's Eve game that started the season with the Favola 12 goals and you had the Sydney Olympics. So uh, the season started a couple of weeks early. Was the early start, and you know, I think you had the ANSAT Cup early on than usual. Did that actually help that there wasn't much time in between the loss and the start of the year? Oh, Jason, I'll go with you, mate. Jump in, Jason. Yeah, jump in. Um, I look at. I mean, well, when did we finish? So yeah, it was you know, late September. So yeah, well, I think we were. I'm not sure when we started pre-season again, but um, I'm sure it would have been sort of somewhere between the middle of November. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, once we put in a big block of training in that uh, November through to December and then before you, you, you knew it, you were back in training early Jan and you're playing, you're playing, you're playing games. Um, um, yeah, essentially, I think the, the season started late Feb. Like, um, so, I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad uh, in terms of um, going, getting, getting to Christmas and then going straight into, into games mode where... Um, which is, I guess, quite interesting where the game's sort of heading now. They probably will start quite later uh, this season uh, or this, you know, coming up pre-season uh, into, into next season. They'll be, yeah, they won't have much of a break, I guess, with the, with the COVID. So, I'm curious, Jason, with the, uh, the grand final of the ANSAC Cup, probably one of the images that sticks to my mind is your hit on Blakey. Uh, oh, and, yeah. And, and, it, and it felt like... For, this is from a fan point of view and I'm probably over romanticizing it, but it felt like it was a bit of a statement from one of your, to your, to your competitors of probably the mindset of the club that year. Uh, is that, was that, was that any predetermined that hit or was it just simply just there he is? It was just in the moment. Uh, it was a little bit in the moment. Um, I, I wouldn't say I, I lined him up, but I, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, like I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go into the contest and knock him out, but I, I, you know, I saw, I saw an opportunity to make pretty decent contact with, uh, with someone. So, um, it, it was, I guess, one, of, yeah, it was just one of those things. It was a pretty, pretty sweet hit. I think I'd get a few weeks uh, these days uh, for it. But in terms of making a statement, yeah, I think we approached that preseason um, to win. 
Um, it was, you know, we went in pretty much with our with our best teams in, in most of the games to to, to actually win the, the pre-season cup. So I think that was the attitude right from the get-go was to, to actually win that uh, rather than, you know, trial or tinker or muck around with, you know, um, you know, players' positions on ground. So I think we, we picked, you know, generally our best team. And um, I think the statement side of things, I think that sort of, you know, stemmed back from, you know, 98 Marshmallow game through to 99. I think we had the wood over North Melbourne, you know, and that's why 99 probably hurts quite a bit when you look back on, you know, should, should have we got, um, you know, at least one more out of the, you know, the three opportunities that we were pretty close to. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I, I remember when I first got the club, 97, uh, 98, you know, Youngy standing up to Wayne Carey and, you know, getting in his face. And that was something that, you know, for, for probably, you know, the 97 season, part of 98, you know, we weren't a fierce team. And I, I think... Um, you know, certainly with the playing group that we had, um, you know, we became a pretty, pretty sort of tough competitive team. Guys, quick question on that, um, on the, the, the dinner thing again, and maybe it's a question for Joe. Um, during that dinner, you, and maybe a, bit, look, a little bit to what um, John said as well, is that um, John Quinn came in and was a big part in the overall season performance. But during that dinner, you were saying that there was things were obviously said. It was a hard dinner to attend and the like. Is it was it that John actually took time to talk to individual players about their performance and could manage individuals at that level, or did, was he very much like sort of an old school, go in, fire people up, and and get the performance that way, or was he probably one of the first guys that started to manage individual um, uh, personalities? Well, the best thing about Johnny Quinn was he, he had no idea about footy had no idea who we were individually or as a team because he's an athletics background. He couldn't even spell football. And if you, if you saw him trying to kick a footy, you, you know why. But that's probably the best thing about it. He knew nothing about it. So to us, he was just, we had a list of whatever, 40 or 50. He, was, we had, a, he had a list of 40 or 50 people, young men to get super fit for an upcoming season. And that's what he did. He didn't care about, you know, Scotty Lucas being a champion, sent out back forward or Wally or Jason Johnson. He was just... I was played 24, was the number of war on my back. Jason was 14, and that's the way he approached it. And it was the best way to do it because he didn't care about previous years. And he just had one goal and it was to get us the fittest um, sort of team we could. And, and he did a great job because that was a finished year of it. And I remember saying um, the other day to someone that I should play 30 games that year. I played all 25 games and all five NC Cup games. So he must have done something right. And, and I keep saying with premierships, it's hard enough to get to a grand final, but the win money, you've got to be a pretty good side, but you need a bit of luck too. And mm. I don't think his uh, management of people, um, the way he trained, like he used to give us, I know he used to give me a lot of time off just for training because he knew I'd played so many games and he'd give me the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll just stay home, don't come to training. And that's the way he sort of freshened you up. And that was a, that was just a, that was a godsend for, for Johnny Quinn to, to arrive at this in a footy club. I suppose his biggest <clears throat> achievement on an individual level almost was getting James Hurd sort of up and running again. Because, I mean, there was real doubts about his whole future, wasn't there, with that navicular injury. Um, Hurd, he sort of got fit and ended up having arguably the best season of footy he's ever played. And it seemed, Sean, I'll throw this one to you, it seemed like John Quinn and Hurd, he had a particularly special sort of relationship. Yeah, he did. They did. And uh, I think everyone can say that about Quinny. Is, um, uh, and I agree with Joe's comments. You, uh, Quinny was a unique the way he went about it. Um, and he wasn't a follower. He had his own ideas and he really backed himself in. And he really sold his program. Like, we really believed in John and what he was telling us. And he was every, every session we did, we thought there's a reason why we're doing it. And we just put complete and utter trust in John and I think uh, Herdy was an extension of that I mean they had a really tight relationship and uh, Quinny called it as, as it is too he didn't care if it was you know James Hurd or the youngest guy on the list if he saw something that he didn't like he'd, te he'd tell you and uh, I think people really respected that and uh, yeah that's where it came from he built a lot of trust and then when it came to him giving you a program or telling you know Herdy what to do Herdy no doubt, not speaking for him, but uh, no doubt really trusted trusted John. 
It, it was an amazing year, wasn't it? Uh, like Scott mentioned, the fact that it started a month earlier because the Olympics were on, so everything got pushed back a month. We also saw the opening of uh, Docklands, which was, what was it called then? Colonial, Colonial yeah. Stadium. So, you know, new ground, you christen the ground. Uh, and that was, I mean, that, that victory really set the tone for the season, didn't it? 94-point win, there's Longy kicking the first goal. What, what do you guys, I'll throw it to you, Scotty. What, what do you remember about the first game at Colonial? First game we'd seen, you know, under, under a roof. It was all a bit, uh, bit weird and wonderful. But the thing that emerged most from it was just potentially how good a side this was. Uh, well, I think we went into the ground maybe middle of the, maybe three or four days before the game. And I, I remember that only half the ground was turfed. Oh, right. And the query was whether it would be ready in time. Now, it obviously was, and there were problems throughout the year with it because um, I think a couple of games might have even got shifted from the surface. But uh, I actually missed the first couple of games. I, I went into the season, I think I was quad injury from memory. So I was actually there as a fan um, or an injured player. And, and it was a really unique experience going there for the first time. But look, what struck me was that the, the team was ready to go and I missed the preseason. So I'd watched the boys play maybe four or five ANSAC Cup games in round one. And um, I couldn't agree more with the guys saying that, you know, the team was ready to win every game they played. I think Jono's hit on Blakey just showed that we meant business. It was an ANSAC Cup final. Uh, we wanted to beat North Melbourne because they had won the previous premiership. Um, it, even though it was a pre-season game, it just gave you that added level of confidence, despite the fact I think the group was full of confidence anyway, felt that they'd come so far the year before and uh, really were on a path to some success in 2000. But yeah, it was, it was a different year playing at Colonial. It suited us, it suited forwards. It was a fast track uh, and you were able to get good separation from your opponent and the ball was fizzing around. So it was always tough for defenders. So, and being a, a marking player, I love the fact that you didn't follow the weather report during the week because you knew that it'd be fine inside the dome. One of the um, one one of the ways I reckon that game set a tone too was uh, so many matches during that year. I remember you guys sort of getting out to a huge lead early, and then you know just sort of holding the opposition off in the second half. I've got to tell you, as a as a journo doing night games, it was sensational because they can be shocking and. You could virtually ride Ness in the match report at half time because the, the game was sort of in the bag. So you just left a gap for what the final margin would be. But was that sort of um, not deliberate that you'd do it all in the first half, but it almost looked like there was a real intent to make, put your stamp on the game as early as possible. No holding off of a, an opposition. It was just bang, bang, bang right from the start. Who's where I throw that to? Joey. Okay. Uh, it wasn't. We were just um, obviously supremely confident in our ability as a team. Um, we knew that no one could probably get near us that year. Um, and we just pretty much said, let's get out, let's bury this side by half time. And I think you'll find a lot of the, um, the second half, Sheets had an opportunity to take a lot of his star players off. Like I think he rested Hurdy a fair bit in the second halves, uh, only because he's, uh, you know, previous injury issues. Um, yeah, but just, as I said, we just out there. We're ready to play. We're relaxed. We need no one can come near us. And I think we enjoyed each other's company that much and we wanted to play through together that much that when that happens and there's, uh, there's such a great cohesion amongst the side, it's, it's, it makes it pretty easy to go out and play, play pretty good footy. Didn't Fletch... Uh, Fletch was all Australian full back. Didn't mm. he kick... I reckon he might have kicked nearly 20 goals. He went forward and kicked two or three in three or four games. Mm -hmm. That was your all Australian full back kick. He'd win the goal kicking in half the teams this year. I wonder, yeah, well, if you want a good example of how dramatic where the game's changed, I was just thinking this before, I'll throw this to you, Scotty, but the goals, five, five guys kicked 270 goals between them. So, Lloydie, 109, you had 57, Scotty, Heard, 36, Carousella, 35, McCurry, 32. I mean, that's got to be one of the greatest forward setups in history, surely. It's so potent. Uh, yeah, look, um, footy was a fair bit different back then, wasn't it? Uh, if you look at it now. But, yeah, and that was the great advantage that I think, you know, just the talks of team. We're all able to help one another because we're all able 
to kick multiple goals. So the defenders weren't able to lay off as easily. So it was good. You're able to get a lot more one-on-ones as a result of that. And I think, by and large, we worked pretty... We teamed well together. We knew how we played. We had a great midfield that kept pumping the ball in, uh, which made our job a lot easier as well. I was going to say, you had to lace out most days, so it made it easier. <laughs> but, and Johnny Barnes feeding us down. So. Yeah, exactly. Who uh, so, uh, would Joe have had... I'm sure would have wanted me to mention that 42 and four in a, grand, in a final is like 60 and six now. I told you not to mention that, Scotty. I know. But I had later. 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 I gave you one on the goal line. You did. I saw it. I watched you that night, Johnny. You did too, mate. I didn't really. Did I ask for it? I think you just gave it to and me. And you know what? Seeds kicked me in the ass for that. He goes, could have been a close game. You could have fumbled it. We would have lost. I said, Seeds, you're you four goals me? up, Johnny. That's what I mean. <laughs> but that's how he thinks. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're talking there about the qualifying final, correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. The, uh, surely everyone's favourite memory of the qualifying final was David King kicking the first goal for North and doing the big <laughs> windmill thing on the way back to the centre. Actually, he did, in fairness, he did yeah. kick seven yeah. in that guy. Didn't age oh, well. well can, that I did, can I just say to you, I think uh, King is eating the pumpkin seed and it's just growing inside him. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he does wear the tightest suits in the history of the world. There's no question about that. Mm. Hey, go, on, go on, Scott. Hey, Barnsley, uh, just a query. I guess I wanted to sort of get how you fitted into the team coming uh, back to the Essendon Football Club again. Uh, it was, I was interested to see in your stats that uh, that year actually you had the most hit outs in your career for one year. So you had 400 hit outs. It, it felt like the system Essendon had that, uh, yes, you were obviously classed as a ruckman, but it felt like as a fan, like you were actually an extra midfielder and that your mobility just clicked with, with the rest of the group. Is that how you kind of felt like? I, I sort of, when the games were right into it more, sort of getting on top, I thought if I could run a bit harder and create a loose man, I'd, um, it would create a loose man somewhere else, like Skunk Carousella and Juzzy Blumfield would become a loose player because someone had to pick up me, then I'd have to leave someone else alone. But to try and get it on the wing after about round 10 was horrendous because everyone was on their own. It was like... <laughs> You know, I might as well just stand in the square. It was a joke after a while, but, you know, I think I must have stunk myself because the time and space I had was, um, was incredible. But, you know, 400 hit outs, I don't, what's that class as these days? Probably last, I'd imagine. But um, I have to give you this point before I forget about it because my memory's shot. Matthew Lloyd only kicked 100 goals twice in his career and it just was ironic how I was only at the club two years. <laughs> How many assists do you reckon you're responsible oh, for? Oh, ask Joe. I'll give him a few assists to hit Hurdy <laughs> and Lloydy and um, Scotty. So those 200 and something goals we kicked that year, we'd have to be part of 200, Joey, for sure. <laughs> Easy. Score involvement, John Barnes, 220. Barnsley, yes. Barnsley, I'm just curious. You're famous for Geelong for a uh, few practical jokes and egging houses. Does that, does that continue at Essendon? <laughs> no, I got a bit old towards the end. It was... Um, oh, shit. Well, <laughs> okay. I didn't she egg called? anybody. Got I didn't, didn't egg anyone. Did I? I know I got yeah, um, someone sp- did. I know I got spikes and um, sollies, but Melbourne's oldest teenager. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> still am. Still am. What can you do? Uh, with, all, with all with all credit to Barnsley, I uh, I must admit uh, when he came to the club, he, he did uh, he did bring the group together um, very yeah. well. It was. Um, uh, you know, we'd, we'd have a weekly luncheon that didn't exist, uh, you know, prior to 2000 that, you know, 15 to 16 guys after our, I guess they call it the captain's run uh, nowadays, but we, we, you know, we'd go to a local cafe, we'd have lasagna and chips and all sit down and have a bit of a laugh. And, um, you know, I, I think that's where it's sort of, for, for me, you know, uh, it started because we, you know, we had fun on and off the field. Um, and a pretty easy time to be able to uh, able to do it in terms of you know how we're performing as well. But uh, I think you know uh, you probably won't won't take a lot of credit credit for it. I know Quinny Quinny has um, received a fair bit of um, credit, but uh, the digger he uh, he was very good in bringing a group of players together for a bit of a, a, a good time uh, off the field. So yeah, we certainly agree with that. Also, and Jason, um, as a tap ruckman, probably the best one I've had. He was just to yeah. give it to us on a platter most times when he was jumping well and he was fitting. Yeah, no niggles. He was, um, yeah, he fed us 
pretty well. Would you tell him what's uh, what time of the clock we want us to hit it to? Whether it be seven o'clock or nine o'clock or ten o'clock, and eighty percent of the time he'd uh, put it down her throat and be streaming into the four fifty. And if you just, didn't if you didn't get there, you'd be you'd cop oh, you'd cop I a give spray. It a, oh, I'd give it to you. <laughs> uh, so hey, just on that point you're making about eating together and stuff, JJ. How I mean, we hear a lot about that about teams being close. How big a practical difference do you think that makes when a side is that close that they want to socialise together compared to other sides that perhaps aren't as great mates with each other? Like where. Where do you see that um, reflected differently out in the on the field during a game? You know, are you likely to to shepherd harder or run harder defensively to protect a teammate if he's a mate? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good it's it's a good. I mean, if I look back at the time, you know, uh, early doors we didn't do it. You know, Barnsley gets gets involved. We start doing it for two or three years, and then Barnsley leaves and it drops off again. So there's. There's got to be a you know direct correlation to sort of I guess the team's performance uh, around that, and I think you know sometimes you you know s- some footy clubs um, at, at times I think people can start worrying about their own agendas and and you know their own you know personal performance rather than than than, than the team. Um, so I think you know that that plays a you know that plays a plays a big part of having everyone on the on the same page. And uh, yeah, I look I, yeah I look, I look at the team and. Yeah, there was no, you know, for me being a young player coming into the team, there was there was no relax around being comfortable in the side. You were always, you know, playing for your position uh, every week. Um, uh, you know, for, so for, for me, there was there's quite a lot of drive, and there was you know quite a lot of drive um, from from beneath as well to um, put put pressure on. But um, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, Certainly did, you know, not knowing it at the time, it certainly did have a, have a massive impact when you look back and reflect on it and, and how close we actually were. And, you know, we had, you know, we had, it felt like we were doing it every Monday, every Monday night, but we'd go down to O'Sullivan's um, Irish pub and, and uh, you know, we'd play, play on a Sunday and, you know, a bit of rehab, go down to um, Queen's Park, go for a walk around and we'd stop back and have a couple of pints and some spring rolls and, and party pies on a Monday night, like, and just have a bit of, bit of a laugh and a, and a joke and yeah easy to do that because you know the team was winning but um it certainly i think you know that that helped and contributed to um i wouldn't say good nutrition got us to uh you know to the premiership in uh in in 2000 i think uh you know it was nice jason after i said i was <laughs> home by eight o'clock really <laughs> totally joe <laughs> totally <laughs> now, john um mate you're known as a you're known as a character we all know that um, off the field, especially egg and, egg and people's uh, houses and the like. Um, how did Sheedy take that when you when you arrived at the club? I mean, did he did he give you a little bit of of, uh, of room for that sort of stuff, um, or was he pretty strict on you? I swear on my life and my kids, as I speak right here, right now, Sheeds did not speak to me once during the two thousand year. He let me go. I'd have a couple of chats with halves, and that was pretty much where it stood because. Pretty much where, as I said before, Johnny Quinn sort of um, told me what I was doing right and wrong. And if I sort of stood out of line, he was the bloke that just, you know, straightened you up and kicked you in the ass. And the honesty that I got out of John Quinn, I sort of brought a little bit forward. And look, I probably picked on JJ a fair bit. I used to tell him that, you know, Gary Ocking would get to that hit spot and he'd crack the shit's bad. And I'd, he'd go, but I'm not Gary Ocking. I said, yeah, I know, mate, but Gary Ocking would get there. Whether that was to push him harder or to get him into a, a state of, I'm going to rip your fucking head off. I don't know. But at some stages, yeah, he's as tough as Gary Hocking. And then I think the penny dropped and he goes, yeah, I know what I've got to do to get there. And that's all the criticism was about. And that wasn't just for him. That was for pretty much everybody in the side. And when you're 31, 32 years of age, you sort of think you've got that right to say stuff. And I think that's what the team was about. And yeah, look, I love, I love mucking around. I love hanging shit on people. I love egging houses. I love letting tyres down. I love, you know, throwing wheelie bins over blokes' fences. But that's, that's how it should be. You know, life's too friggin' short. Look at us now. We're locked inside my friggin' bedroom. I'm looking at a friggin' white ceiling, watching fucking Beverly Hillbillies, and I'm talking to you idiots. What do you do? <laughs> No, and you, I, I you, could, you, could, you could still go outside and throw a wee-wee bin, can't you, in your house? Well, yeah, uh, the bin day was yesterday, Rowan, so I'm pretty much snapped <laughs> <it> now. <laughs> that's, why I actually, that's why I asked that question, Barnsley, because I, I just wonder if there are any more characters left in the game. Like, is there, 
in in the game today. I mean, maybe not egg and joint uh, egg and blokes houses and stuff. But is there any is there any room nowadays for characters in well, AFL clubs? I'll give you I'll give you a perfect example. How many blokes have got a parking meter in their backyard that they stole out the front of a pub? <laughs> Just you, Bunzi? I would think it's only be me. But yeah. I planted I planted it in someone else's front yard, so <laughs> that's what we used to get up to. A bit of fun. Yeah, no, I, I, I trust you. I lament that. I mean, the the comment, commentary interviews are wildly professional nowadays and very respectful and probably coached within an inch of their life. But it it is nice from a supporter's point of view to see a bit of emotion, a bit of character in the footballers. But yeah, you don't see it much anymore. Speaking that's why we loved about- you so much. By the way, speaking of emotion, I guess round 15 had a, an infamous moment with Sheeds. Uh, Mitchell White, the uh, uh, siren goes, Sheeds walks out, does the slit of the throat action for... Did anyone pick up what actually happened to Mark Johnson that day that made Sheeds outright, sort of outraged? I think Mark, Mark will look after himself. We're pretty... Um, you wouldn't want to take on Mark Johnson, I don't think. But I don't think I don't know what happened. But one thing that Sheeds did, and he was great at galvanising the group. Like um, I always said, when we won games, he'd, he'd refer to us as they, and then when we lost, it was always we. Um, just little things like that, where um, he just fly the flag for his players and his club, and uh, I think that just brought everyone together. And it wasn't, it wasn't. It didn't matter how it was perceived on the outside. Uh, Essendon people saw it as a positive, galvanising the group. Um, you know, don't mess with one of our players. So that was just just sort of feeding that, I think. So, but in terms of what actually happened, I've got no idea. <laughs> have you have you seen Mark Johnson's ears lately? Yeah, he's got cauliflower ears. Cauliflower, like, yeah. you, you know what he does for fun, don't you? Yeah, wrestling. Yeah. He wrestles Sam Greco for fun. How, how much fun is that? <laughs> The bloke, the, the bloke at Eacher. Uh, in Jono's world, it's the best fun. <laughs> is, that, is that a consequence of the Mr. Sunbury tag? He feels oh. he's got to keep it going? Or? I don't know. I think, I think he just likes just, it. Yeah, he's just... Hey, well, um, I, I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask a, like a more technical one. This, this was, you know, undoubtedly the best performed side of all time. You played such a brilliant brand of footy. You, you touched before on the amount of space guys were able to get. Sean, you did it a lot. Uh, uh, Rammer did it all the time. Cara did it all the time. Technically, this side was so good. And as many, as much as there were stars in it, it was a really even side too. So that even guys who, in p- terms of pound for pound talent, mightn't have been in the top half of the team still ended up playing important roles. You know, you had guys like Moorcroft, great job. You know, your, your great mate, Wally Barnsley, you know, he had a fantastic year in defence. Um, Paul Barnard comes off the bench and kicks four goals in the grand final. What was it about the game style that made you... I'll throw it to you, Scotty. What was it about the game style that made you so dominant and so even across the board where even a guy, like, say, a guy that didn't end up playing in the grand final side, I mean, uh, well, Dean Rioli, unlucky, but... You know, I know, like Judd Lavich, guys like that played a few games that year. Anyone could come into that side and do a job and do it well. Yeah, look, I think perhaps it works in reverse, Rowan. We were able to play the sort of football that we did because of the talent of the team. Yeah, right. So that, I mean, doesn't matter how even you are, if there's not a high level of talent, well, you just won't get the job done. And I think, but I couldn't agree more that you know, the difference between whoever thought player five and 15 was, was negligible. And often that could change all the time because it was such a talented team. And it was an even team in the sense that everyone brought something different to the table. So it had a lot of flexibility. I mean, well, he played center half back, played half back, played wing. Um, Fletch would go to full forward, Uh, Blumfield, Carousella, wing, half back, half forward, um, Merck's like Merck's was a luxury, really. He played. Joey probably. wouldn't move from the centre though. No, Joey didn't. He was a lock there. <laughs> the centre square. Centre specialist. So I think there was flexibility within the side, and I think that also stimulated the guys because I think if we, to your 
point earlier, if we're 10 up at half time, it's a pretty boring second half for Fletch at full back, who has seen 15 entries in a half. So <laughs> throwing him up forward, he kicks a couple of goals. So I think that was important. And spot on, Sheets read the group really well, which I think has come across that he knew when to push, when to the Barnsley's point, hardly spoke to him because Sheets just trusted Quinny and Harves just to keep that under control. Whereas there'd be other players here he would have more to do with perhaps players that like to hear from the senior coach, whereas some were happy just to see him on a Saturday. What was the, uh, what was the uh, reasoning for not singing the club song quite a lot after, in that year? Was John Tolotis. John, John was that Quinn? Kevin Bartlett? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Kevin Bartlett. Yeah, KB spoke to us about two or three weeks out from the grand final or the finals, maybe. Jump in, boys, if I've got uh, it wrong. Yeah, no, I think it's Really yeah, and I think he spoke because obviously I think he played in five and it had been something that either Richmond had done or KB said, what have you actually, what, why are you actually singing the song? What have you, what do you got to celebrate? And I think that just became um, a commitment within the group that the next time we sing the song will be when we win a premiership. Okay. That's it. Alvin, they're, they're interesting little gestures, those things, aren't they? What, what about... As, as the winds mounted up and, you know, you could see this incredible history looming, was there a sense of, um, you know, a greater uh, vulnerability or, or such that you might have an off day and lose? Now, obviously, you did eventually lose the uber flood game to the Bulldogs, so, albeit in the second last game. But could you feel that... I, I, I can remember, you know, we as journos, where everyone's trying to look for the fly in the ointment. So everyone's writing, you know, how do you beat Essendon? What's the Achilles heel? Um, and could you sense that there was this sort of pressure building? You know, when are we going to lose? Or was it you were just so confident it never entered your head? Sean? Um, it wasn't really the goal, was it? Like, we're just going into the year trying to win as many games, but... Um, I, th I think the one time I remember, I think we were on the we played Port Adelaide. I think it must have been round fifteen, and that and that was we. I think we were fifteen in a row, which means we'd beaten every team. And I mentioned it then, and we had a couple of beers on the bus on the way home or something. And but in terms of the pressure building, um, we were just having that much fun playing footy together. Like seriously, like we were that we were that close bunch of guys. We just really enjoyed our training, playing, catching up, socialising. So it was just, um, but at the end of the day, we just were, were just so focused on winning a premiership. It didn't enter our minds. And I remember uh, we lost, obviously, to the Bulldogs. They did, they did us the biggest favour in the world because, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, if that happened on grand final day where a team flooded us and we hadn't been exposed to it, um, and then I think Hawthorne might have did it or someone... Did it, did it to us in the next round or something, but we actually trained it during the week, how we'd cope with it and how we'd do it better. So it almost was, um, yeah, blessing in disguise. And it, if anything, it probably released a little bit of pressure and just reset us and focused on the rest of the year. But didn't it it stuff training up, mate? Spoken. Stuff training up, because that's all we did, was <laughs> practice the flood. I think the uh, Bulldogs game, didn't Barnsley, uh, you, you had a clash with um, Brad Johnson, right? Did, how did that go about? Clean him up. I didn't do anything. I'm not like that. <laughs> he punched was, me in the back of the head. There was some contact made there, uh, Barnsley, wasn't there? I bumped him and he punched me in the back of their head. Is that really? And they both gave us a week. And I went, are you freaking kidding me? The shit, it was. Do, I would have got 42 weeks these days. <laughs> there was nothing in it. Can okay. I... Can I, 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 if we start sort of talking towards the finals, um, the, the feeling of that North Melbourne win, the 125 point win, um, is that as, as, as invincible as, as, as you could feel in, in your career, that, that game? Because we, we felt it as supporters, I can assure you. <laughs> I, th I think it sent a message. Any extra sauce on it because it was North Melbourne? Oh, could have been. Uh, but they're not even like us. Uh, you know, obviously, 99, as the boys said before, we pretty much handed them a flag when they only had to play Sydney and they got a flag. And um, Yeah, but it was just towards, as I said, towards the end of the season, I think we, when we knew we were going to finish on top, or as she's always said, you've got to finish top four to get a second chance. And that was your goal. You make them finish first, second or third or fourth. 
that was our goal. And, and when we knew we were going to finish on top and, um, you know, we had no chance of losing top spot, I think last, our last three or four games were only pretty average because I think everyone was just ready to go for the finals and really, really ready to gear, gearing up for the finals. Um, we'd had enough of the home and away shit. That was boring, you know, we got by 10 goals at half-time and we wanted that stuff to finish because we only really had one goal in mind and that was to win a flag. And North Melbourne were the first ones uh, that we sort of got through and got through them pretty quickly and pretty easily. And that was just the start of the, the juggernaut that our final series was because, let's be honest, having average winning finals point margin of, like you said, 70 odd points is... Quite freakish. It's uh, unheard of, mate. So um, yeah, it's, it was well. Just... I think I think uh, I mean, I, I me mean, as a fan was probably the most nervous for the Carlton game because uh, yeah. it was it was almost like we're here again, prelim. You've had a dominant year. Uh, what was your mindset during that week? Was there did you actually have the, uh, the confidence you would win? Because at one stage, if I remember, Carlton won about thirteen in a row. Uh, so they were they were they were into some good form, did was there nerves kicking in? What was the message that week from, from Sheeds and you guys? I'll tell you how nervous I was. I was in Matthew Drain's office ordering 20 grand final tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of confidence, uh, Barnsley. I had to get 20 tickets. I had to be first in. We beat Carlton. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got them. We played Carlton in about round 20, didn't we? And we yeah. had lost yeah. and they had won 13 or Yeah, it was th- 13. 13. It was Friday night. It was yeah. 90,000. So that was our test. I mean, yeah. before then, they were right in the hunt. So that yeah. was for us to know that. And then I think Jono did us the biggest favour, notwithstanding he played bloody well, but he put Cooter out of business. I think Cooter, did you clash with Cooter, Jono? Uh, yeah, I think we... Yeah, knees Good in the knees. Marking, and yeah, so, yeah. marking contest, yeah. Yeah, so we won that game by four or five goals and then through Carlton losing the first week of the finals to Melbourne, they flipped the side of the draw and they ended up on the same side as us. But the preliminary final is always the nervous one because you're not there yet. And 12 months before, we hadn't got past that day. Um, what, yeah, but going in fairly confident from memory because we were able to beat them two or three weeks before and they went into that game without Cuda, who arguably played the best 10 or 12 weeks of any player I've ever seen. I, I thought the, um, the great achievement of that preliminary final win was just the efficiency you did it with. So I've just called up the scores, but, you know, it was like four goals to two, quarter time, 20-point lead by half time, and then the third quarter, six goals to one all over at three-quarter time. It was almost like you took the emotion out of the equation. And for a game that had that big a build-up and everyone's talking about, well, you know, a year since the infamous 99 preliminary final, it was quite a business-like, um, you know, less passionate sort of win, which is probably exactly what you would have needed, I thought. Yeah, that was the game. I mean, they were our main rivals, I reckon. That was a game where, you know, you really set yourself. And once we got over that, I thought, you know, if we play like that again, we'll be okay against Melbourne. But I remember the coaches, the rivalry with Carlton was massive, massive during our playing days, the 90s and that. But um, like Surrey and Haas and stuff had a real dislike for Carlton as well. So hmm. the week, we used to walk in, and I remember Dimmer Hardwick one day, so the only team where we'd get these witches hats and we'd do walkthroughs, we'd never ever do it except when we play Carlton. But we had this big meeting the last training session and Tim would walk in and goes, oh, the panic canes are out. The panic canes are out. We're playing Carlton. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, he'd have the witch's hat with two to feed his name on it, Rat and Whitnall. You know, if he does this, he does this. And and uh, we always said, oh, here, here we go, the panic canes, because it was Carlton and it was a bigger build-up uh, within the club as well. It just meant more. So uh, there was always a, a, just this extra edge when we played Carlton. I wonder if uh, Dimmer gets the panic tones out at Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean, while I've got you, um, I've heard you talk about this before. Uh, the grand final comes um, and, and Hurdy addresses the, the players before the game starts. Can you just talk about uh, what he actually mentioned to the guys? Yeah, I still remember this. So he grabbed us and he said, um, uh, he said, there's no Norm Smith medalists here today. There's only premiership players. Um, I think that was Hurdy's way of saying, boys, I'll take care of the Norm Smith. You just go and do your job. Um, yep, yep. But, um, but going back to Joey's point before, it was such a, uh, and Jason, that just such an even team and no one really cared who got the kudos. It's like, just get the job done. And um, that was just reinforcing that. Just do your job. 
uh, if we do we'll all do our job, we'll walk off premiership players. And um, she's referenced during the year because I remember um, you know, she's loves his cricket. Joey, Joey and the boys love their cricket as well. And and the Aussie team had a good cricket side during that that era. And they'd say it always referenced the Australian cricket team. You know, if if Slater gets a duck, Gilchrist goes and makes a hundred. So if someone's down, you know, someone else steps up, and that's the type of team I think that we had in two thousand. Yeah. Oh, no, you, 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 yeah, go on, Greg. Go on. No, sorry, just, just a quick one. From what Scotty said earlier about having the talent, like you can be the, a great a great drilled team, you can be a, a good team in adverted commas, but if you really haven't got Scott Lucas and, and Jason Johnson and Joey and, and Sean and all, everybody and Barnsley. Um, well, on yeah, the side, say that a bit, mate. No, 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 mate. You're, you're always there, trust me. Um, yeah. uh, your, your, est- your estimations have gone way up in my eyes, mate, when I hear about the silver service that you used to provide. Yeah. Didn't, I didn't know it was that good, bronze. honestly. Bronze. It was bronze. It was bronze. Oh, I would, yeah. Yeah. Too good for the guys that couldn't get to positions. I, what am I oh, don't know um, that shit yet. <laughs> I'd love to be a rover. <laughs> no, uh, Scotty, what you said, you've got to have the talent in the side as well. And I'm just, it's just dawning on me again is that we did have the talent on the park. And like you said, we had the talent on the park for um, the majority of the season. We didn't have any massive um, injuries. But that mix of the talent... Plus that, what Ro, what Rowan mentioned about the clinical nature of the way we played some of those games where you all had the one vision of going out there, no one wants to um, lair eyes around, get the job done, match that up with the talent that you guys had, and it's no wonder um, you're as, su- as successful as you were. So just a, just a really interesting uh, um, thing to learn from talking to you boys. Yeah, just on the, on the grand final, as you said, Sean, I mean, it, it, you did, really did get the job done. The only thing that was sort of missing early on, sorry to bring this up, Scotty, was accuracy because, you know, it was 4-8 at quarter time. And I think when Barnard came off the bench, you know, sort of, what, halfway through the second quarter, and it was, a, it was an OK lead, but Melbourne just kept kicking one to give themselves a chance. And Barney sort of put it beyond doubt. It was 40 points by half time. But was there any sense in that grand final... Oh, shit, are we going to shoot ourselves in the foot with poor kicking? Scotty, I should say here too, you did more than redeem yourself on the accuracy front in the next green fall. Thanks, Rocco. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think so, right? I don't think there was... I, I just... I think we just, as a group, had uh, incredible belief in, um, you know, what, what we were doing. We had an incredible amount of trust in each other in terms of you know, um, players doing roles. There's, a, there's quite a few guys that did, you know, huge roles, you know, whether it be Mark Johnson on on Farmer or Hef on, on Uze on a wing, um, you know, to, 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 to free up the Calisellas and the Blumfields. You know, I think those two would have been arguably best on ground at, at half time uh, in that in that game. So, yeah, I don't think there was ever any nervousness uh, around our start. I, I do recall them starting reasonably well. They, you know, they, you know, they probably... Yeah, they they kicked a couple, and we 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 were struggling to kick some goals. But you know, I think once we got settled, it was um, I wouldn't say it was all downhill, but it, it you know it felt like it sort of after half time. That that's for sure. But I mean, there was a there was a fair bit of, yeah fair bit of confidence. I, I wouldn't say you know bordering on arrogant, but not not in a not in a in a way that um, uh, you know I think we had you know we had to play that way uh, as well. But yeah, as I said, incredible amount of belief as a midfielder. You knew it was going. Going back, you could trust that the you know the, the defense was going to rebound it. You find yourself on a wing or in some space, um, um, yeah. And then you know if you, you knew you knew if you got it in there quick and long, uh, your forward line was going to um, either mark it or, or going to get some crumbing goals. So, yeah. one of, one of my favourite memories of the images of the day, Barnsley, is you and Dean Wallace embracing after the siren. It's been a long journey for both of you and you having played in the losing grand finals and stuff but you would have had a fair bit of time to have it sink in that I'm about to win a premiership medal can you sort of remember how you felt during those last 10 minutes I remember playing West Coast I think it was 92 yeah and I remember John Worsfold grabbing Chris Lewis and he hugged him and gave him a kiss and said because we've, uh, we've got this, we've won it. And it was about 10 minutes to go in the last quarter. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it sat in my head for so friggin' long. And I said, that's bullshit. So when um, 
the time came along, I saw Gary Moorcock about, I don't know, 15 minute mark of the third quarter. And I said, Gazza, come here, mate. And I gave him a kiss and I said, we've got it, buddy. And uh, he goes, you're calling that a bit early? I said, no chance, mate. We've got this in the bag. And then it was about 10 minutes to go in the last quarter. And I, she's pulled me off and I sat in the bench for the last 10 minutes. And when the siren went, it was just this overwhelming sense of, I don't know, what they call it, just just anxiety just left me and it was like yeah. um because i've lost eight grand finals all up in my footy career as a junior so right? right right through to when i'd finished and that's the only premiership i've ever won so wow. it's um it sort of meant a fair bit to me and and when i was looking for wally and found him it was uh yeah it was quite an emotional moment and i hung on to it for the, about half an hour which was uh probably a bit sooky lala at the time <laughs> but for me it was um that's what i did and you know i cherish it every minute of the day Still yeah. do. What, what about uh, what about say you, Joey? I mean, you'd you'd done it in '93, and I know you were very young. A lot of players that win one young, they say, "Oh, you just you think it's going to happen every second year." You know, by the time it did happen again, it was seven years later. Did it feel much different the second time? Oh yeah, completely different, mate. Obviously, '93, I was only 18, and a, a young kid. My first year of senior footy, and you, you won an AFL flag. You, as you said, Ro, you think it's going to happen. Every second year, are you going to play in a grand, grand final every second year? But to, to wait another seven years to get an opportunity to, to play in a grand final, um, I just think I appreciated 2000 a lot more. Um, I still remember Bomber Thompson, Mark Harvey in 93, um, just going around to the young kids saying, you know, just try and take it easy on the grog on the weekend because these are memories that only come around once, every, once or twice a lifetime. And um, don't do what I did in 84, 85 when him and Harvey were on the tower and, you know, probably got too pissed too quickly and didn't really have any recollection. So that was the great advice they gave me in 93 to 2000. When I was able to just to really enjoy it, um, look around and just to see the, just the excitement and the enjoyment on not just the boys face that you play with, but you know, the support staff, uh, the supporters, uh, your parents, your partners, your brothers and sisters. It's, uh, it, it's quite unbelievable. It's probably something you can't, or someone, you probably a person that hasn't actually done it really can't actually experience because it's actually quite, Quite freakish. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Ooh, what's what's going what's going on there, Bunzi? Oh, I found a sock in my drawer. I was going to say a pair of socks there. <laughs> <laughs> is that um, is that and, uh, Kieran Spawn and Andrew yeah. Manning? Is it Andrew? Is Andrew Manning? Yes. Oh, it's Andrew same, Manning. Same primary school as Numbles. Yeah. Dalesford Primary School. Kieran, so they weren't actually talking seriously about wearing those things, were they? Bunzi mowing his lawns with that on the last weekend. You don't even know where I live. Jesus you don't Christ. even know where I live. That's where Kathy Freeman's suit came from in 2000. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tell you what, um, mate, I, I want to take a dump. It took me an hour to get out of that suit. <laughs> <laughs> how do you reckon, Joey, how do you reckon um, yeah, the second time around went when we were at um, the Royal at 6 a.m. in the morning and then you know, <laughs> walking up Napier Street at 10.30 uh, with... I don't I've got a great one of my, my one of my greatest stories with Jason Johnson. Um, he's a great fella. We're pretty good mates. We um, had a, obviously cut a, a massive night Saturday night, and I don't know how, but we ended up at the Royal. It was six or seven a.m. and obviously the Royal was only about three, three four hundred metres from Windy Hill, and we had the family down the Sunday. We had to be there at ten o'clock, and I looked at John. We're still in our full suit, S in the suit, the Royal. Obviously, when you play a flag, you don't really need too much grog. You're in a natural hole anyway, and. I got to about 9.30, looked at John and I said, mate, we've got to get up to the ground because we've got the family day at 10 o'clock. So John, Jason and I just thought nothing of it. We just started waltzing up, had a can in our hands, waltzing up and there was thousands of supporters going up Napier Street at the family day and they look around and they think, shit, is that John Owen? Is that John Owen Joe really walking up to the Napier to Windy Hill Sunday morning? Pretty pissed, but it was quite funny just to see the excitement and the surprise on, on, the, on the fans' faces as they just walked up arm in arm with, with Jason and I. Excuse me, everybody. Got to get in there. I'm a player. Excuse me. Excuse me, guys. Excuse me. Just got to get through. Just got to get through. <laughs> it sounds like it was a bit tamer than 80, 84, 84 and the famous Paul Vanderhaar story. You'd remember that. But I oh, know you weren't there yet, Barnsley, were you? No. Nah. You know, Vander end, ending up in a supporter's uh, bedroom, just stumbled into a house and crashed on their bed. And they were an Essendon <laughs> supporter and fortunately rang the club and said, uh, I think I've got your premiership centre half forward on my bed. <laughs> were you were you in a potato fight we had at the Vic Market, Johnny? <laughs> yes. <laughs> was that the Sunday night? Yeah, it was the Sunday night. 
from yeah, Solly. Well, I, He's an idiot. Yeah, I, I remember, like, I literally, uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm like, yeah, never did drugs in my life, but I remember yeah. going to bed as watching the grand final at three quarter time at your place on on the Monday. That's that's how that's how much adrenaline and that's how much of a high you get, um, you know, through, I guess, the experience. It was literally, yeah, Saturday rolled into Sunday night at the Monday. Bar and then, um, well, I think it was yeah, maybe Glenferry Road, then Star Bar, and then yeah. literally and then back. He- Back remember Dimmer bought the missus? Remember the, the mad on the Sunday? Yeah. Dimmer bought his missus? <laughs> she walked in and he asked blokes and she bought his missus. Damien was uh, having much fun with him. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, no, it was uh, good times. Um, good times. So, do, do you, all of you can answer this. Do you look back on that whole season? Obviously, any premiership is fantastic. But is there a, a greater sense of, satisfaction perhaps that you've been part of the almost the ultimate team performance not just on one day or two days but for six months of sustained 100 percent excellent form i mean footy doesn't get played any more professionally in any any better than you guys played it for six months and that is an amazing thing to be part of yeah i'm pretty well, yeah i'm pretty content i'm i'm um yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty happy with uh, yeah the opportunity I got in the career, uh, and the, yeah, it was, yeah I'm, I'm pretty pretty happy with it, and nothing that anyone can take away. I mean, I dusted off the the jumper and the the medal, but I don't think it's seen the, the light of day um, since it's been framed. You know, 15 years ago, it's been living under a bed. So I thought I got a bit nostalgic tonight and pulled <laughs> it out. But um, yeah, no, I'm, for me, I'm 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 really happy and content. I feel really comfortable. If you had a told me, Rowan, I was getting the arse from Geelong and I was going to fall into a premiership, mate, I would have said you're full of shit. <laughs> so I'm very happy. Yeah, I bet. What about you, Scotty? Yeah, I, the one thing that shits me is we finished on top three years in a row and we got one flag. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, jealous of Joe, he got two. Joe's <laughs> jealous of Harves and Bomber because they got three. Yeah. I think... But at the same time, there's so many that didn't get the opportunity to play in a grand final or play in a flag. So, no, extremely. Because there is a lot of fortune involved. Like, oh, there look is. at Wellies from South Australia, Jono's Kilmore, Joey's around the corner, Digger's up on the Murray. Like, I'm from southwestern Victoria. But the draft and zoning meant that we all came together. Like, there's a lot of fortune and luck that comes into it, no doubt about it. Well, it's an inter- that's an interesting point, though, isn't it? Because you did you finished on top three years in a row, and mm-hmm. there sort of is a a feeling, I guess, that you under delivered. I don't I don't actually agree with that because no, I, neither I reckon, do I. No way. Well, I reckon ninety nine. Yes, you finished on top, but you know, not by a long shot. You did it under duress. You weren't part of it, Scotty. Heard he wasn't part of it. Two thousand and one. You know, things started to go a little bit wrong on the injury front. You know, and. By the end of that season, I think you'd agree. I mean, Brisbane were playing a better yep. level of footy than Essendon was by the end of that year. Mm-hmm. So it's not... I don't look at that and think, oh, you guys blew three flags. Do you Do you feel like you did or...? Oh, I reckon we I left don't. one. I, I reckon we left one out there. Yeah. 90, I feel for the... 99, the boys were the best team. You got to also... I don't know Scotty's talking, but you've got to realise that... Imagine a side trying to win a grand final without Scotty Lucas and James Hurd. They're two pretty yeah, good yeah. goals in 99. Yeah. And then in 2000, obviously, we were unbeatable. And then 2001, yeah, we a lot just, of people know. But I think there were six or seven of us that missed about 10 or 12 weeks that year. Yeah. So we, 01, nothing went right, really. Yeah, and we all came back towards the end. So we are probably only probably 75, 80% fit going into a final series. And there was, as I said, I reckon there was me and there was about five others that weren't probably match fit. And, and we got to the grand final day, it was fucking 27 degrees. I think it's going to be 27 degrees. In, in, and and we, we were in front at half time. I think we had the first three or four shots of goal in the third quarter. So yeah. it was still a yeah. chance. Yeah, was like, to obviously, come up, to, come up against a, you know, an all conquering Brisbane yeah. side. Of it. And that's. History says it's, they were an unbelievable side. Yeah, they were. Just timing, wasn't it? The lines yeah. were flying and it was the start of their, their era. So. And McCurry was really shot that day, wasn't he, even though he played from memory. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. McCurry and Blum, 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 Blumfield and Head. No, oh, and, and Herdy wasn't uh, true. Herdy had a groin yeah. injury. Yeah. So, no, the planets didn't align. But, I mean, that's a really good point about 99, Joey. That, that's what I always say. People, 
carry on about that preliminary final like it's the greatest certainty he's ever to lose. But, I mean, you've done it all year without two key forwards. You know, yeah, but like, Rowan, you know, Rowan, we're missing a big point here, mate. I was at Geelong. Jesus, the amount of got yeah, Johnny me Barnes was there. Yeah, you, were the miss, you were the missing uh, wing yeah. party. I get there it. There you I go. It, no silver service for the mids. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just an odd side note, Scotty. Uh, was there ever truth to the rumour that uh, Lordy blamed a bad performance on you from uh, you snoring the previous night? <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, it was in 1997 and we played Freo in Perth. And um, mind you, we got hammered by about 15 goals. You got pissed hammered? <laughs> no, <laughs> not Lordy. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, what on, uh, on vodka and orange juice? Yeah. No, we got hammered and I did room with him. The best thing about that was that I never had to share a room ever again after that. <laughs> so I got a, because you shared rooms to maybe 01, 02, maybe even later. But no, I was, no one would room with, with me. Which was. Well, you're bad. a snorer, eh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm a, I'm a father. No one rooms with me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's all part of the plan, but you know, all part of the plan. <laughs> Look, we'll, uh, we'll start to wrap it up. Look, uh, I, I can't thank you guys enough for, for coming online and, 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 and um, just supporting the show and, and talking about a year that, you know, just we, we obviously as fans, you know, I'm speaking as a fan here, was just, it was just sheer joy. Like you just were smiling every week. And to give that to fans is, is, is pretty amazing in itself. And um, so I, I, I can't thank you enough. And, and, you know, it's an absolute honor with all the laughs and everything. It's an absolute honor to actually talk to you guys. Um, and I'll, I'll let you talk as well, Grant. Yeah, yeah my, I, I, along the same lines. I don't know if you boys like JJ's had his, um, his jumper under his uh, bed for a while because you guys lived it. You guys did it. Um, but from a fan's point of view, you've probably heard this a million times, but I really want to say a massive thank you um, to, for, your, for the careers you've had, for the effort that you put in for the club. And from a fan's point of view, I know it, it sounds a bit flippant and stuff, but from a ban- fan's point of view, you guys are a massive part of our lives growing up. And for especially the 2000 season, it means a massive amount to fans. It really does. So um, a humongous thank you very much for joining us on the show tonight um, and the brilliant, um, the brilliant careers that you all had. Um, and just a, a huge thank you from a fan's point of view. We really appreciate it. Yeah. So we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah, yeah, we'll probably wrap it up um, when we get to there. So um, we'll do a quick rip around um, before we say goodbye. Joey, uh, where can we find you nowadays? Oh, here we are. This is, all, this is good. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got to do the plugs. Tell yeah, your business, mate. 100%, mate. I'm a transport company called Mesita Logistics. So we freight all sorts of stuff in Australia. So our website, Mesita Logistics, uh, there's only one Mesita family in Australia. So it's pretty hard to miss. So M I S I T I. So beautiful. Thank you. JJ, what, what are you up to? Uh, I became a chef, uh, Grant. So yeah, we've got a, a food business. So we, we deliver ready made meals. Um, you, you might find us in some uh, independent supermarkets and Coles. So Dynamic is the name of the business. So uh, spelt Dine is in di- D-I-N-E-A-M-I-C. So dot com dot au. So if you're locked down, you need some, don't want to cook, you're sick of cooking, get some home delivered meals to your door. I'll, I'll yeah. vouch for it. It's great stuff, Jojo. It's really good. Thanks. Thanks Beautiful. Right. Sean. Oh, g'day, guys. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I've got a mortgage broking business called Wellman Finance, but uh, yeah, thanks for having us on. And uh, yeah, I really, uh, I really missed our annual catch up with uh, the 2000 boys and all the staff. And that's something that I really look forward to. So I uh, uh, really looking forward to catching up with uh, Scotty, Barnsey, Joey and, and, jo- and JJ and uh, making up for it next year in 2021. Is that, is that how long we're going to be locked out for, Wally? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not, uh, we're not mentioning politics, are we? <laughs> Bro, <laughs> how long? <laughs> easy, Scott, easy, easy. Scott, you're going into prime business time, aren't you now? Uh, yes, yeah. So, yeah, I'm involved in uh, play management. So, yeah, you're right. This is um, the season where, yeah, re-signings, the listings, unfortunately, and trades will all be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Hmm. Okay. Jay, uh, John, you doing anything I, we I need to couple, know about? I've got a couple of things. Um, Dan's a wanker. 
Oh, the, yeah. Dan it's, Johnson or Dan? Yeah. Dan Andrews. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, good. Okay. Um, That's for right. He's, he's a listener, so we'll hear that. Oh, good on him. Well, he's a double wanker then. <laughs> the, um, you people loving what we do for a job is great. I've got two hip replacements, uh, three broken jaws, a rod in my arm and plates in my hand. So I'm glad I've had made your, your uh, laugh at us and moan with us at the same time. I don't do too much. I'm not as smart as those other blokes. I work for the council. You know, my wife has a business and it is shot to this shit. She's got a travel agency, so no one's travelling there. So I'm just about to go and jump off the bridge, boys. So I've got nothing to do. Nah, just just that beer to your right there. Just have well, a that's my sponsor. It's Pure Blonde Light. Okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> sure we may and be, it's Light we, Blight. We may not be we're able to drink those now. back in 2000. No, oh, no one was. <laughs> I was drink, drinking out of shoes. Rowan, what are you up to? Um, well, I'm running uh, my own website, footyology.com.au, which um, is primarily a, a football news site, but we, we have expanded, actually. So we're running stuff now on movies, TV, uh, music, a uh, bit of social commentary. Fortunately for Scotty Lucas, not much political commentary yet. I'll probably leave that one alone. Um, but it's going well. It's, uh, we've got some really good writers on board. Martin Flanagan, um, Francis Leach, uh, Shelley Ware, Angela Pippos. Um, so check it out if you're interested in some decent sort of independent footy journalism and absolutely no clickbait. Which uh, yeah, I've, read a, I've read some of the articles. You're doing a great job. Uh, thanks. So. No, pressure. No, it's, um, yeah, I think a lot of us are getting sick of some of the stuff that passes for football media. So pretty keen to, you know, try and give people some quality and the response has been good. So um, thanks everyone. And and just quickly, thanks for the chance to do this. And thank you, you guys for, uh, in all the years I've covered football, there certainly hasn't been a more enjoyable one than that. And like I said, to be able to write your match report by half time was just a perfect, perfect little arrangement. So thank you. All right, boys. Um, again, a massive thank you for joining us uh, on the Lunchtime Catch-Up podcast. It's been a real, uh, a real honour for us, I must say. The listeners are going to absolutely love this. We'll pop it up on, um, on the podcast and YouTube uh, probably tonight or tomorrow, and uh, the guys will um, be able to listen to it from then. So a huge thank you for coming, and uh, we'll head off from here. Thank you very much, guys. We really appreciate it. Hey, boys. Thanks, Thanks boys. Thanks, guys. Keep well.